Thank you so much for joining us today. We would love to hear how God is using this ministry in your life. So please, take a minute and send your story to stories at edgewaterchurch.com so that we can celebrate that with you. And if God has used this ministry to touch you in any way, then we want to encourage you. Partner with us financially. Help us to continue to deliver God's word to the world. Just go to edgewaterchurch.com and click the Give button. Again, thanks for joining us and enjoy today's message. reminded us of hope and today we light the second advent candle the candle of peace the peace we seek in our hearts as we await the coming of Christ and peace on earth as announced by the angels may the light of hope and peace burn brightly in our hearts let's pray God, we live in a world that provides us with little peace. Our schedules are full and we don't make time to be still. Your promise that you will give us peace so that we no longer have to be troubled are afraid. Lord, send your peace. Amen. As I was growing up, um, my dad worked for IBM. And uh, if you've worked for IBM, you know that IBM stands for I've Been Moved. And, and we definitely were. Um, after being born in Cincinnati, we lived two different places in Indiana, four different places in Tampa. And now as a pastor, I went to seminary in Kentucky and I've served three different churches here in Florida. And, and in all of these places, the, there was always a time, especially at the beginning in that transition time, where, where I just kind of felt out of place while we were settling in. The big adjust, biggest adjustment though came when I was in third grade because we moved from Indianapolis to Manila in the Philippines. Uh, it was a big adjustment. Now granted, we, we went to the international school there. We weren't totally immersed in the culture necessarily, uh, but there, there was a new language around us. Uh, there were people who looked different from me. There were different customs, different ways of getting things done, and of course, lots of different foods. Uh, things like adobo and balut and, uh, and ube ice cream. Now, uh, ube ice cream is this uh, bright purple color, and you can imagine for a third grade boy to have this like almost glow-in-the-dark purple ice cream as a possibility. You're like, yeah! And so so we, we said, well, what is that? What, 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 is it, uh, what is that we're interested in trying it? And so we asked the person behind the counter what ube ice cream tastes like, and he said, ube. <laughs> Didn't help very much. Um, but actually, you know what? I recently looked it up and ube, it ends up that ube is a purple yam. So a uh, good thing I didn't know that then. Um, so if you happen to like purple yam ice cream, then ube is right up your alley. Um, but anyhow, so there, there I was in this, in this strange place with, with my blonde hair. That's my, me and my little sister sitting on a, a carabao. And uh, um, I, I stuck out like a sore thumb. Uh, in public, actually, people, as we were walking through the market, people would, would reach out and touch my head just to see if the hair was real, see if I was, I was a, real, a real person. I, I often felt uh, pretty out of place. Uh, today we're going to look at a movie where, uh, where someone else was out of place. I actually, I, I hadn't watched this movie at all until uh, this week getting ready for the message, but the rest of the folks on the worship planning team, they were like, this is great. And, and last week when we had you holler out your Christmas movies, many of you hollered this one out. In 2003, New Line Cinema introduced us to Buddy the Elf. So let's take a look. Well, whether you've seen the movie or not, uh, uh, let me just give you a little story here. Uh, as a baby, Buddy was put up for adoption by a single mom who later passed away. Uh, one Christmas Eve, Santa came to Buddy's orphanage, and Buddy escaped from his crib and crawled into Santa's bag, and he ended up at the North Pole and where he was raised as an elf. Uh, of course, he grew to be much bigger than the elves like you saw there, but he still considered himself to be an elf. Eventually, he found out that he was human, and he learned that his father lived in New York City. So the movie tells the story of Buddy's journey to New York uh, and his quest to finally meet his father. All along the way, Buddy spreads this Christmas cheer uh, with everyone that he meets. 
So like each and every one of us, Buddy grew up in a particular culture. There were some things that, that defined who the elves were. There were those three main rules for being an elf. Uh, treat every day like Christmas. There's room for everybody on the nice list. And read this last one out loud with me. The best way to spread Christmas cheer is singing loud for all to hear. Um, they also had some core values, uh, hard work and presence and being nice to each other. Uh, and if you saw the movie, you remember they also had their own four food groups, candy, candy canes, candy corn, and syrup. Uh, some of you can identify with, with that a little bit. Uh, so, so that was Buddy's core culture. Um, and as he went around in the different culture of, of New York City, though, he stayed true to his core culture of who he was. As followers of Jesus, we have a culture that we come from as well. There, there are things that should define us as Christians. Think about that for a second. What are, what are these things that should define us as Christians? And let, let me go ahead and hear from you. What, just shout it out loud. What are some things that should define us as Christians? Loving, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, lot, lot, lots of those good things. Now, I, I noticed nobody, nobody said protest signs. Or uh, clever bumper stickers or snarky Facebook posts. Nobody said those are the things that define us as Christians. Unfortunately, sometimes that's what we live out in, in some ways. But you know what? As the old song goes, they will know we are Christians by our love. By our love. If we are truly living as followers of Jesus, then our cultural behaviors should mirror the Jesus, right? Okay? P people should be able to feel like they know Jesus better after spending time around us. Can that be said about you? We, we are called to be like Jesus. Our lives need to demonstrate Christ-like character. Now, one of the things that I like about the Advent wreath that we light every week is how it, it symbolizes four particular Christ-like characteristics that we need to embody. Things like hope and, and peace and joy and love. And, and each week we are reminded about the role of these characteristics and how they were embodied in the Christmas story. Imagine what our world would be like. Imagine what your life would be like if, if the four main words could be used to describe you were hope and, and peace and joy and love. Another part of the imagery of the Advent wreath has to do with the light of the candles. Um, just like the, the, the light... The candles bring light into our environment. We are called to bring light into our environment as well. Jesus himself came to be the light. This is what he said in John chapter 8, verse 12. It says, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. And so again, if we're trying to model Jesus, if Jesus is the light of the world, we need to be light as well and in this darkness. And, and he tells us this in Matthew 5, 14 through 16. He says, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. How are you doing at being light? You know, light, light makes improvements wherever it's present. It, it brings a sense of comfort and warmth. It brings illumination. It, you're, it doesn't do any good to take your light and put it under a basket if, or, where no one can see it. it. It doesn't do any good that way. And, and sometimes what happens is the basket goes over the light and the lack of oxygen makes the light go out. You know, that happens to us sometimes. When we, when we are not shining our light in the world, sometimes we know it, it just kind of goes away. But see, that's the thing. Light was meant to shine. Okay, it, it, it's part of the culture of being a follower of Jesus. If you feel like maybe your light doesn't shine as brightly as it used to, or you wish it shined more brightly, or maybe you've never let it shine at all, um, what, what, what needs to happen? At our Christmas Eve services, if you've ever been here, we, we have the candles, and we hand the candles out, and we always just encourage folks that uh, uh, if, if you have the lit candle, don't tip it over. What happens? The candle that's not lit, it has to draw closer to the source of light in, in order for it to burn the way it's supposed to. We need to do the same thing. If, if we want to shine more brightly like the light of the world, we need to draw closer to the light of the world. 
Okay, you need to get closer to God. We've, we've talked about this before, that the more you hang around a person, the more similar you become. Um, I, I grew up in Indiana, but I, one of my sets of grandparents lived in Pensacola, Florida, and I had some cousins from Alabama right across the border there. And over spring break and Christmas and summer times, we would come down and get together with them. And then we'd go back to Indiana, and, and I would say y'all for like a month after that because I had been around my, my southern family, and, and that's just how they spoke. But because I had been around them intensively for a while, I started picking up some of their mannerisms and characteristics. We, we pick up the characteristics of the people that we are around. So if we want to pick up Christ-like characteristics, we need to spend more time with Jesus. We, we need to spend time reading about him in the Bible, learning more about him. We need to spend time with his people in community. We need to, uh, to grow in our relationship with him through prayer. Because the more that we are around him, the more that we'll be like him. Also, the more that we are around him, the more that we'll recognize him. Uh, Jesus uses the imagery of the sheep and the shepherd in John chapter 10, verse 27. He says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Okay, the, the more time the sheep are around the shepherd, the more they get to know the voice. They, the, the shepherds would, would park all their sheep from all the different shepherds and from all the flocks kind of in just one big uh, pen at night. They, they didn't have like a coat check system for the different sheep. What would happen is the shepherd would come in the morning and go, I don't know what he'd say, hey, y'all sheep, let's go, whatever. I don't know what they would say, but the sheep would know the shepherd's voice and the correct sheep would weave their way out of that group to get a chance to walk with the shepherd. And so um, because they had spent so much time around him, they knew the shepherd's voice, okay? Now, I'd, I'd never, uh, I hadn't seen Elf before uh, this week, but one of my, one of my favorite scenes involved uh, Buddy in New York City, and he had just found out that Santa was supposed to show up the next day. Let's take a look. I, I, love, I love the passion and excitement of Buddy getting to see Santa. That he's like, yes, I, I know him. I, he, he just couldn't wait to be in Santa's presence. Wouldn't it be cool if we had that same type of passion and excitement about God's stuff? That, that we'd wake up on Sunday morning and go, yes, I get to go spend time with God today. It's so odd, like the commercial. What, what day is it? Church day, you know, and we just get so excited. And, and, and we need to have that same type of passion and excitement about being in God's presence. And, and, and you could see just that, that joy. But then it all kind of turned when he actually saw who was there. How, why was Buddy able to recognize that counterfeit Santa so quickly? Because he intimately knew the real one. Because something didn't look right about that one. Something didn't smell right, like beef and cheese or whatever. He, he sized up what he saw with what he knew. And we need to learn to recognize the, the smell of the beef and cheese out there, you know. We, we need to know what doesn't smell right and what doesn't look right. I, I know I mentioned it before, but I want to give you permission to think critically, okay? Never take what I say or what anyone else says for granted. God gave you a brain for a reason. Use it. Check, check out what is told to you. Check out what is said. Check it out against the Bible. Okay? Take some time to do that. Jesus warned his followers that there are going to be some folks who would come along and, and try to teach the wrong things. He said this in Matthew 7, 15. He said, Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep but are really vicious wolves. There are lots of things out there that may sound good, but they may actually be contrary to the culture the kingdom of God. Now, along with checking things out against Scripture, um, you also need to compare it with Jesus. Okay, I know that the whole WWJD, what would Jesus do, that that's so overly cliche, but the reality is, it's not a bad measuring stick. Okay, if we're supposed to be like Jesus, then we need to be able to model his behaviors and, and do what he would do. So how would this look in real life? Let me give you an example here. Sometimes, um, we, especially early on, maybe in our relationship with God, we, we think that we have to get our act together before we come to Jesus. You know, the, that we feel like we have to get here, but really we're down here, and so we have to grow more before God would want anything to do with us, before he, he could ever use us for anything, and, and, and before he would ever even want to hang out with us. We, we have to get up to this certain point. But take a look at Jesus' life reflected in the Scriptures. Did Jesus only spend time with those who were, were uh, righteous? No, he didn't. He, he was constantly hanging out with folks that the religious community considered to be vile sinners. 
So he was sitting around having dinner with these folks, and I don't think that he was like sitting there at the table going, ooh, don't get too close to me. Or, um, pass the salt, but you need to stop being bad. Uh, oh, man, please have the bread. Go and sin no more. I don't think that's how Jesus handled those situations. I, th- I think he just genuinely loved people. And, and people loved him, too. I, I think that they wanted to be near him and that they wanted to be different because of his example, because they had been near him. Jesus didn't just sit back and let people come to him. He actively went and pursued them. He called them down out of sycamore trees. He, he talked to them at their places of work. He, he met them where they were hungry and sick. He talked to them at church. And if Jesus was willing to do all of that for people who were far from him, then surely he wants you to come to him just as you are. That you don't have to wait till you get to whatever imaginary point that may be. He wants you just like you are. And and even beyond that, he wants us who are followers of Jesus already to be willing to go and meet people where they are. Maybe not yank them down out of sycamore trees, but but to talk to them at their places of work. To to meet those who are hungry and sick. To, To talk to them at church. Wherever we go, we are called to represent the culture of Christ. If we are followers of Jesus, then our lives are transformed and we're given a job to do. There's a, there's a section of Scripture in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20. The first verse we look at a lot, and, but the rest is, is great for what we're talking about today, especially where it says, uh, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Okay, so that speaks to that transformation that occurs. But it goes on and it says, and all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. And then here's our job to do. He says, we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. An ambassador is an accredited diplomat sent by a country as its official representative to a foreign country. Okay, so when we turn our lives over to God, we're we're acknowledging that our true citizenship is in the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of this world. There there are a couple places in Scripture where where it talks about kind of the difference between the, the two cultures. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it starts off and says, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. So it talks about how there is this this custom, this culture and behavior in this world, but we're not supposed to mirror that. We're supposed to have something a little bit different. And, And then in John 17, 14, it says, I have given them your word, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. So again, Jesus is talking about kind of being in the world, but not of the world. And that we have those two separate kingdoms. That we're, our citizenship is in the kingdom of heaven, but we have a responsibility to be ambassadors into this world. So we need to act out our role as ambassadors. An ambassador speaks on behalf of the leader. The things that we, that we say in our everyday life should represent Jesus. The words that we say need to be the words that he would say. The things that we do need to be the things that he would do. The characteristics of our life need to be the traits that characterize Jesus. Just as he is the light of the world, we need to be the light in the darkness of the world of somebody around us. How, how could you maybe be the light in someone's life? Maybe, maybe even just right now as I, as I mention that, a, a name or a face came to mind. Somebody who needs some hope and love and warmth. Somebody who needs you to meet them right where they are and and show them how much God loves them this Christmas. Or maybe you're sitting here today and and you're realizing that that maybe this is what you've been looking for because you've been wandering around in the darkness and, and you need some of these things that the Advent candles represent. You need to have a sense of hope and peace and love and joy in your life. And and so we want to give you a chance to respond to that today, to be able to say yes to God and say, yes, you know, God, I'm tired of wandering around in the darkness. I've I've stubbed my toes and bumped my head too many times, and and I want the light, your light, to come into my life. And so why don't we do that right now? Let's take a moment. Let's pray together.
God, thank you so much for this time that we have to be here today, for the way that you've called us um, to this place, and there's not a single person who's here by accident. God, I thank you that you've given us the uh, awesome responsibility of being your ambassadors. God, I ask that you forgive us for the times that we maybe haven't taken that seriously, or that maybe we've done just not a great job doing that. So I pray that you'll help us as we go into this coming week, that there will be some specific things that we can do to to be your representative that much better, to be able to be the light in the darkness, to be able to share your uh, hope and peace and love and joy in the light, in the lives of those around us. So God, I pray that you help us to maybe find that one person who needs your light and God, let us represent your light to them in their lives. And so maybe as you're here today, you're realizing that you, you've never stepped into that light. You've never had that, the light of God come into your life. That you've never received forgiveness for your sins. That you're still carrying around the, the guilt and shame. But well, we want to give you an opportunity to, to respond, to, to turn your life over to God. To, to change your citizenship from the, the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of heaven. And, and the way that we do it around here, we, we say a little prayer, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray this prayer out loud, and I invite you to repeat it after me, phrase by phrase. You're not going to be doing it by yourself, because we all need a fresh start. We all need forgiveness. We all need uh, the light to burn maybe a little more brightly. So I invite you this morning to repeat after me and pray, Dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sin. Please forgive me of all I've done wrong. Let your light shine in my darkness. In Jesus' name, amen.